After 26 years on the run, who would have thought that one of the kingpins of Rwanda's genocide would be enjoying a quiet retirement in an unassuming suburb of Paris? Hello, everyone. I'm François Picard. Welcome to the France 24 a debate. Earlier this month, French uh, police raiding the apartment building where the aging Félicien Cabouga was living with one of his sons. How could a man with a $5 million bounty on his head be hiding in plain sight? We'll ask what brought an end to a quarter century on the run across two continents. We'll ask about Wednesday's rejection by a Paris appeals court of his conditional release and about extradition efforts to face international justice. Would a trial shed new light on the 1994 massacre of an estimated three quarters of Rwanda's Tutsi minority? To this day, the facts are disputed, particularly when it comes to France's role. A sore subject still poisons relations between Paris and Kigali. Will the arrest contribute to a warming of relations that began two years ago between Emmanuel Macron and the winner of Rwanda's civil war, Paul Kagame? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the case of uh, Félicien Kabouga with us to talk about it from Paris at the time. He covered the Rwandan genocide as it was unfolding for French daily newspaper Le Figaro. Patrick de Saint-Exupéry is the author of The Unspeakable, France in Rwanda. Thanks for being with us. Hello. I want to welcome as well from Abuja, Nigeria, Mausi Shegun, Africa Director at Human Rights Watch. Welcome to the show. From New York City, we're joined by oh, Jonathan Belloff, you. teaching fellow at the <laughs> Great Lakes researcher at uh, SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies at, uh, at the University of London. And uh, thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. And uh, from Waldschut Tingen, that's a German town on the Swiss border, Judens Kayetezi, the author of A Broken Life, a Rwandan Genocide a Survivor. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and on Twitter. The hashtag is F24Debate. Yeah, Félicien Kabouga, he first makes his money in tea and a flour mill. He builds Rwanda's first shopping mall. Later, though, uh, it's he gains notoriety with uh, the arming with machetes of the uh, dreaded Interhamway militias that would carry out the genocide. And... Radio Mil Colline, the propaganda arm of the killing. More on that story from Emerald Maxwell. He had been living in this apartment block near Paris under a false identity. But after 25 years at large, Felicien Cabuga has been arrested. As one of the alleged architects of the Rwandan genocide in 1994, the 84-year-old had a $5 million bounty on his head. French police raided his home at dawn. Voilà, ce matin, on était surpris parce que en descendant, comme tous les voisins, puis on a vu toute une armée de, de gendarmerie qui, qui préparait cette opération-là. Félicien Cabuga has been on the run since fleeing Rwanda in June 1994. But prior to that, he was a successful businessman, part of the Rwandan president's inner circle. The UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda indicted him in 1997 on seven counts, including genocide. Kabuga was accused of using his wealth and influence to funnel money to militia groups that carried out massacres against the Tutsis. Alors, il y a deux volets à son acte d'accusation. L'un qui concerne euh, la propagande du génocide, c'est-à-dire la, la création et le, le fonctionnement de la radio-télévision euh, d'Emile Colline, qui a appelé au massacre des Tutsis du Rwanda. Et puis. Euh, la création d'un fonds de défense spécial qui était un fonds donc créé par plusieurs hommes d'affaires, plusieurs personnalités de pouvoir, dont Félicien Kabouga, et dont l'objectif était de permettre de rassembler des fonds pour pouvoir euh, conduire les, les, les massacres, pouvoir acheter des armes. Yeah, and uh, before we get into Patrick de Saint-Exupéry, the surprise of this uh, arrest that took place in anières sur seine that's the name of the suburb, uh, just to remind for our viewers uh, just how big a fish, if you will, Felicien Cabouga is. Felicien Cabouga is, is really a big fish. Uh, um, everyone has been surprised because no one was thinking he, he, he was living in Paris. It could have been a possibility, but the, the, the fact was enormous. Uh, but 
when listing that, when, when uh, after your arrestation, you have to to, to get in mind that he begins his run, not not him but his family in the French embassy at Kigali in '94, and then 30, 23 years later he finishes his run in Paris. That's incredible. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of questions about it. Just to remind our viewers uh, w w once again, he's a member of this uh, hardline sort of, I wouldn't call it a secret society, let's call it a network called Akazu. Can you explain what that was? Yeah, the, the, the Akazu was, was the little family, the, 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 the union of people who, who were really running Rwanda behind the scene. And the Akazu was mostly people from uh, Abiy Arimana family and the uh, Agat Kamziga. Uh, family, the wife of the president, Abel Arimana, who has been killed in '94. Uh, Kabuga was in the middle of that piece. Uh, he got a, a lot of uh, sons and uh, children, and uh, four of her, uh, of her, of her children, of his children were married to, to, to people related to, to Abiy Arimana family directly. Uh, one of his uh, uh, daughter was married to, to the head of the uh, of the interamwe the the Rwanda militia who have been killing so many people during the genocide you, so he was really a man in, in in the heart of the system the heart of the system and just one final question on this uh, we've talked about it ever since everybody around africa knows what radio mil colin was explain what that was Oh, it's very easy. Uh, Kabuga was the president of uh, Radio Milcolin, and the nickname of Radio Milcolin is Radio Des. Uh, Judence Kaitesi, what was your reaction when you heard the news of this arrest? So, um, as a survivor of a genocide against Tutsi, I was excited and I was also happy that uh, he was arrested. In 20, 20 years, 26 years and the, that's how I for me I was in 26 years I was trying to live and to accepting the losing of my parents and I was also thinking that we can have also justice as genocide survivor. You yourself survive a machete attack to the head, a blow to the head. Um, when you, Fustan Kaigema, how how central was he, in your view, to what happened? Okay, so I was 11. I was 11 years old. And then, so, because we know that was, this was something they prepared for, for, to kill the Tutsi. So that's who was putting the machete to my head was uh, the, my neighbors my neighbor and uh, so i was losing my memory and uh, also i was almost like four years without talking i start to talk as a child and um, so then in 26 years i was um, i was building myself also to to live yeah, and, and so now we now it's going to be a different sort of questions we'll go back to that with you uh with, uh, with the news of this arrest, because, well, the next step is going to be uh, a trial. Everything is going to be revisited over and over. I, I want to bring it up w with you, Jonathan Beloff. First of all, something about the arrest uh, itself, which uh, I think should be stressed, uh, which is, <coughs> ironically, uh, we may have the coronavirus pandemic to thank. Um, the Reuters news agency spoke with one of the gendarmes who said that during confinement, since a lot of other cases were suspended, they had time to go over the Kabuga case and they started looking at leads. They go uh, to, they find the trace of his children and one of the children takes them to that apartment in Anières sur seine But uh, th this um, gendarme colonel, Eric Emro, claims that uh, the morning where they carry out the raid, they're not even sure he's going to be inside the apartment. Your, your thoughts on it? It's been a bit, COVID has played some of a role in this. Um, they had been tracking him before COVID, before that erupted throughout Europe and now throughout the world and forced everyone to stay at home. 
it was beneficial in a sense that you know more some more resources were being paid were being focused on tracking him and of uh, just monitoring him. There is a little bit of a disappointment of possible uh, connections of where he would have gone, the people that he would have met, trying to find other genocide perpetrators who are residing in France. So it has played a role, uh, a positive, but also potentially a negative that we that more people have not been connected. Were you as surprised as uh, Patrick was when you heard the news? Um, I was not. Western Europe, especially France, because of their connection to the Akazu, to the Habyamana regime, and their role in the genocide, a lot of genocide perpetrators have been able to flee or get French assistance. Look, you have the head, you know, you can argue the head of the genocide, Agatha Habyamana, the wife of the president, who still resides in France. So while I was not really surprised that he was there, I was still happy that he was finally finally arrested. Uh, Patrick de Saint-Exupéry, uh, your, your, your reaction to what you just heard there from, uh, from Jonathan Beloff? Well, uh, after mass, it's always possible to say that there is no surprise for, for that guy to have been arrested in Paris, in France. But when, when you know the, the French history in Rwanda, uh, that was something, uh, uh, in a way, very surprising, whatever, because there, is so many, there are so many implications between France and Rwanda, and that's such a shameful story between France and Rwanda that you, ca you could have imagined that the French authorities would have done everything not to have such a guy in Paris, and it hasn't been done. So there is another question, a new question, uh, on the relation between France and Rwanda since '94. On that question is quite important. So Radio France International's Binetta Diane went to uh, uh, Anier on the day of the raid, spoke to the neighbors. They talk about a, a man who is quite quiet and taciturn. She tried to find out what his alias was. None of the neighbors knew what his name was. They were all very shocked to discover his real identity. And uh, he was keeping a very low profile from what it sounds like. Uh, so, yeah, because uh, I've seen all kinds of conspiracy theories here and there. Uh, Mousy Shagan, your thoughts on this arrest and the fact that it happened in France? I mean, my, my initial thoughts were, 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 were one of, uh, was one of excitement um, that this was happening after so many years. I, my, my thoughts were with the victims um, what they, and the survivors, what they would be thinking as the news broke that morning after 26 years that one of the main financiers um, of, the, of the genocide that affected their lives and the lives of their loved ones uh, was finally in the net. But it was also questioned, how, why did it take so long? Um, and, uh, their, and their concerns that, you know, um, uh, Felician Kabuga is now an older gentleman. Um, how, you know, what will the, is his trial look like? But it was also really a, a sense of hope uh, that justice will be done um, finally. It's taken this long, um, but that um, it was a reawakening of hope um, that this could finally happen. But, you know, again, the, 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 the concerns were if he has been living in France for the last three to four years, why did it take this long um, for the French authorities to find him? Before then, where has he been? Um, the stories are that he's been in Germany, he's been somewhere in Africa, some places in Africa. What are the responsibilities um, of this UN member state uh, to collaborate yeah. and to cooperate um, with the mechanism for, for their prosecution? Yeah, the, the list runs long, uh, doesn't it, Mousy? Uh, uh, Switzerland, uh, uh, Congo. Germany. Uh, Germany, Kenya. Kenya. Uh, how do you explain that? Burundi, Belgium. I mean, <laughs> Belgium, of course. Um, wealth can buy you a lot. Um, wealth can buy you a lot, uh, but you know, it's also uh, the, the the sense that you you know you you can pay you can pay people uh, to compromise them. But the surprising part of it is how the authorities in those countries failed to recognize and uh, fulfill their obligation. Um, under the UN Security Council resolutions. Um, 
but you know, with, with different aliases, uh, one other African man in Africa could be, you know, like a fish in a sea of fishes. Um, but, you know, if, if he's a wanted man and they had all of the indications, it shouldn't have taken this long to find him. And I think that the victims deserve um, some answers. Uh, they should be, it should be investigated. Um, every one of those countries where he's, he has been alleged to have hidden, um, including France, uh, for this number of years and did nothing. There was even a, a story that he was in Germany um, 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 for, 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 for um, I believe it was um, some medical um, um, treatment um, a couple of years ago. I can imagine for someone like Judith who was living in Germany to understand that this man was within the shores of that country and nothing was done to apprehend him. Um, it, it's just not good enough. Judith Kayetezi, is it... Uh... Yeah. Uh, something that the Germans are talking about, the fact that he had gone through Germany? Yeah, I had that also. He was in Germany in the treatment for the, uh, because he was sick, but um, I don't know. I think also the, it's just, we need some explanation how he was living here and then they didn't find him. You know, the conspiracy mill has been running in overdrive on social media ever since this arrest in the suburbs of Paris uh, back on this. I believe it was the 16th of May. Uh, and uh, Jonathan Beloff, you know, uh, different camps have different theories. The French wanted this. The Rwandans wanted that, et cetera. But again, I get back to what I asked you earlier, which is, is it just, well, a gendarme with a little more extra time on his hands? who can, re have, can reopen a cold case. Is that just the simple explanation? I often like to think that the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. And there's no doubt, it's, there's no doubt that's part of it. N something like this, like so many other things, there are many, there are many reasons that lead to it, that lead to the conclusion. Um, so, while COVID, while, you know, finally having the, the French authorities having the time to track him, this had already been started before COVID, as well as, you know, fundamentally, you have to look at Rwandan French history, you have to look at other genocide perpetrators that are in, that are in um, France, as well as a lot of other countries in Western Europe, as well as the United States, Canada. There were many different factors that led to him getting to France, jumping all around Europe, as we've all, as everyone's been saying, but finally of him being captured. While some of the conspiracies of, you know, this was a tit for tat move, France versus and Rwanda, Macron and Kagame talking about, okay, let's arrest him to help improve ties. Chances are that is probably limited. More likely is, you know, because of COVID, because of multiple other things, and because of luck, he was finally captured. All right, looking ahead now, uh, we're set to have, again, conflicting narratives going forward. We got a sort of a, um, a foretaste of it on Wednesday at his appeals hearing to uh, where bail was denied uh, or conditional release was denied for uh, Kagabuge. The, uh, the, there was already an argument over his age. Officially, he is 84. He claims to be 87. He sat in a wheelchair, um, spoke only in Kenya Rwandan. Um, and his defense attorney uh, opened the argument over where his uh, trial should be on appeal before an international court. There is still a res what they call a residual international tribunal for Rwanda. Uh, which sits in Arusha, Tanzania, and in The Hague, or here in France. Let's listen to his attorney. We have the documents of the lawyers who have Arusha, who tell us that the conditions of the hospital are not adapted to the situation of the health of our client. So we estimate that it's here that he will remain, at least that we don't want to judge him. But the reality is that if we want to go to the process, Et lui le demande par ailleurs parce qu'il ne souhaite pas rester dans l'histoire comme un génocidaire. La meilleure des choses, c'est de le laisser ici pour qu'il soit jugé et qu'il fasse face. Il est prêt à faire face à ses responsabilités et ça permettra aussi de discuter de cette période qui reste une période historique pour, le, pour la France. Je... It remains a historic period for France, says that attorney. Uh, Patrick de Saint-Exupéry. Uh, so we heard two things there. Uh, one have the trial in France, and two, it won't just be, obviously, 
his trial. It'll be more than just his trial when he's talking about France there. Well, the thing is, we still don't know where, where he's going to be tried. On the first time, he will most probably be transferred to, to La Haye. Uh, on In La Haye, the decision is going to be taken for, 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 for his trial. Where? There are three possi possibilities, basically. It can be in Arusha, it, can be, it could be in Rwanda, it could be in Paris. Uh, my personal feeling would be that the best possibility will be Rwanda, that's obvious. The crime happens in Rwanda. On 25 years later, it's time for Rwanda to have uh, to have the occasion to make uh, an important uh, judgment trial. Uh, second possibility would be in Paris. Why not? It's it should uh, be exam examined. But there have been some uh, genocidal trial in Paris, and they they have been very very fair, uh, very well done. Uh, on the third possibilities, uh, for me, it would be the lay. The last would be La mm -hmm. or Arusha, because it's international justice, and it's very far away from the facts. And for justice, for real justice, wh whatever the judgment will be, uh, there is a need for publicity. That There is no justice without publicity. Uh, Maozi Shagun, um the communique that Human Rights Watch put out raised questions, right, about would it be a fair trial at the court of Arusha, where there have been failings in the past? And would it be a fair trial in Rwanda, where due process is a question now, as Paul, Kagame, uh, Paul Kagame's uh, government at times has taken a more authoritarian bend, you might say? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, we, 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 I mean, just to, just to um, confirm that, we do believe that it would be best um, for suspects to be tried in the country where they committed the, the crimes. Um, but we generally indeed do have concerns about due process and fair trial in Rwanda, um, um, especially with this government um, in place. Um, we, we, we documented several uh, cases of abuse um, from Rwandan authorities, by Rwandan authorities, um, against individuals. I mean, a plethora of cases of opposition uh, party members and all other, other people in the country. Um, when it comes to the, um, the ICTR, um, our concerns with the ICTR was the refusal of the, the tribunal to um, consider and investigate uh, cases of um, abuses by the Rwandan Patriotic Front um, after the genocide had occurred in July, when it took over um, Rwanda in July 1994. We documented a huge number of cases of abuse, of killings, of rapes um, by the RPF uh, that the tribunal failed to, to consider uh, uh, for trial. Uh, and so, you know, but, but with regard to Kabuga, um, uh, I, we believe that, um, you know, the, the ideal place would be outside of Rwanda, but that decision is um, obviously up to, the chief, up to the chief prosecutor to decide. Jonathan Belloff, where would you like to see the trial take place? Fundamentally, the trial should take place in the in the country where the crime happened. While likelihood that it will be sent to either The Hague or Russia, fundamentally, uh, the genocide did not happen in the international community. The international community abandoned the country where it happened. They abandoned Rwanda, where the genocide occurred, where Kabuga financed and was one of the key instruments um, in the organization of it. And with many Rwandans themselves over the past eight years conducting research in Rwanda with the question of international justice, Rwandans have no idea who that is for, the consciousness of the international community or actually for the, or actually for the survivors and victims. So fundamentally, I believe he needs, if, we, if the international community really cares about justice for the victims and survivors, it, can't, it must take place in Rwanda. And the international community can also participate in helping and watching over and providing the finances or the support like they did with the uh, local uh, judicial mechanism, Gachacha, the Truth and Reconciliation, which was much more effective than the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. You agree with that, Judence Kaitezi? Yes because he committed the crimes in Rwanda 
and will be nice also if you uh, he his uh, the trial will be in Rwanda, especially for the survivor to 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 follow the trial. And uh, okay, so we'll 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 look into that. Another key component of this is. Uh, the warming, and, and we heard Jonathan mention it, a warming of relations, a relative warming of relations between France and Rwanda uh, over the last two years, really since Emmanuel Macron became president. In 2018, uh, a tech summit here in Paris was an excuse for Paul Kagame uh, to uh, return to the Elysee Palace for the first time since 2011. Shortly thereafter, his foreign minister, Louise uh, Mushikiwabo, uh, was appointed as head of the Francophonie, the group of uh, French-speaking countries around the world. That didn't pan out quite yet when there was the 25th anniversary commemorations of the Rwanda genocide in Kigali, where Emmanuel Macron was not in attendance. But nonetheless, at the time, the French president said that uh, he would be pressing for more cooperation. The most important issue to advance on is the place of the Tutsi genocide in our collective memory. I think we owe it to the victims, to the survivors, and to French soldiers. The time has come to carry out calm, documented work and to give that work the necessary resources. We'll be delegating this task to a group of researchers which will be put together in the coming months. Patrick de saint exupéry that was exactly two years ago. How are things today between France and Rwanda? Well, things are really okay, but the problem is that French official, officials have been saying so many craps in, about Rwanda for, for years on years that uh, building a, a real relation between France and Rwanda is really a, a very heavy task, and it, it's going to take very long uh, uh, to get uh, still. Uh, last year in Rwanda for, for the commemorations, there were only a very low profile French delegation. And uh, there are signs that people are trying to, 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 to do their best to, to, to rebuild a new relation. But again, so many craps and craps for years and years by so many French officials on what did happen in Rwanda. Makes and could the, the arrest of, to, 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 try to, to forget. Could the arrest of Felicien Kabuga help to normalize relations? Yes and no. Yes, because symbolically it's very important. No, because Felicien Kabuga knows a lot about the French relationship with the people who, who have been committing the genocide. When he was arrested, he was uh, having a uh, uh, RDC uh, IDs, uh, and they have been having 28 identities for 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 for, for all the time of his run. Uh, he knows really a lot about the French relationship with all the people who have done the the genocide. So it could be yes or no. There is no definite answer up to now. Jonathan Beloff, when you think back to the. The trials of uh, Nazi war criminals that took place, most notably the later ones here in France. Um, mm. uh, there was, they were billed as trials for history, but when they actually took place, there was a significant amount of stonewalling, of gaslighting. Uh, what are you expecting? What truths are you expecting to be uncovered? There aren't that many, within. There aren't that many truths necessarily that need to be uncovered. Fundament the the French's role in Rwanda during the genocide, before the genocide, arming and training into Hamway the killing squads is well documented. It's well known. I believe really it is not really between France and Rwanda, but it's France understanding its own history. And I think that this case can help much more in the public eye. Uh, show to the pop show to French the French population about their country's history in Rwanda and the, the problematic relationship that they had and that they continue to have. When it comes to the everyday facts of his participation in the Agazu, in the Habyarimana regime, and during the genocide, a lot of that's been well documented. Now we will learn more definitely about this. But I believe really the education and the effect will hopefully be on French society, which could 
potentially lead to more genocide perpetrators residing in France being found and arrested. All right. There's the question still to this day, 26 years later, of how uh, Rwanda uh, c- deals with its past. They're still digging up remains of uh, the victims of that genocide. It's a France 24 report uh, that's read by Maria Gorth Nicolescu. These villagers are searching the grounds around this pond, transformed into a mass grave during the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda in 1994. Around 3,000 people were killed here. Authorities drained the pond to allow searches. Since April, people have been gathering new evidence of the horror. They were using these types of stakes made out of sharpened wood to kill the Tutsi during the genocide. They would strike them before throwing them into the water. We're finding these stakes several years after the bodies have decomposed. Bones exhumed by the villagers during the past weeks are brought to the Nkamba Memorial. Once dried, they are placed inside the memorial's crypt. Around 1,150 genocide victims have already been buried here, and the numbers keep growing. The people we have lost during the genocide of Kwantan and Tutsi Discoveries made in Rwanda have also furthered investigations on the perpetrators. In Kigali, 22 agents of the Genocide Fugitives Tracking Unit are hunting down those who participated in the massacres in order to bring them to justice. Our work is to ensure that we identify those who have been convicted uh, liaise with the hosting countries, tell them to come and investigate the convicted persons that are on their territory. If they want to try, they can go ahead and try. If they can extradite them back to serve sentences, uh, they can as well do that. The unit says it has issued 1,144 arrest warrants throughout the world. Only 23 of these suspects have been tried abroad, and 24 were extradited to Rwanda. Yeah, so only a handful uh, of those who've been pinpointed have faced justice. Judas Kaitezi, it's been 26 years. Nonetheless, is it difficult when you watch that kind of report? Yeah, it was difficult for me to watch that report. and uh, um, And we always to 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 be strong not to and to 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 make like like this people now is not easy not to to, to say because of uh, to watch these things it was really sure. hard for me yeah yeah no i understand and you and you mentioned yeah. to us earlier how uh, you lost your parents you were 11 years old um yeah. have uh, have you been able to mourn your parents? Do they have a, a proper resting place? No, because I didn't find them until now. I'm still searching. So you're still searching for, for them. And you said it was the neighbors who carried it out. What happened to them? Uh, no, it's for me, the, my, my neighbor is who was cutting on my head. So it was an uh, injury. And uh, but my uh, my parents, I didn't find them where they put them. They killed them and they put somewhere. So I don't know where. So I'm still searching. So when you look ahead now to a trial like the one of uh, Felicien Kabuga, is it going to be painful or is it something for you that's essential? Um, I'm. I think it's, it's both because it's painful also to to see like at 26 years he, he they didn't find him and he was living in different countries and um, um, also is um, like um, also happy like to 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 have justice and also maybe we can uh, also find more people who who did that who was with him who are not yet found. It. Mauzi Shagun, uh, watching that report and looking at the efforts that are still being conducted to find perpetrators, big and small, your thoughts on how much this weighs of the psyche of not just a nation, but a continent and the whole world? 
I, I, I wish that he weighed even more. I wish that he weighed enough for, for countries and governments to realize that they have the responsibility to find the remaining uh, fugitives uh, from the law. I mean, you, the UN uh, pr prosecutor, um, uh, you know, revealed uh, a couple of weeks ago that um, Augustine uh, Bizemana, one of the, the fugitives um, who should be tried by the International Residual Mechanism, has been dead since 2000 and he was living and died in Republic of Congo. He's also indicated that uh, Protes uh, um, Imperiana, the, the remaining uh, of the three that should be tried by the residual mechanism, is somewhere in Africa, possibly in South Africa, but he's not getting cooperation. Hopefully the, the arrest of uh, Kabuga would trigger the cooperation and collaboration of the countries who are playing host to the remaining fugitives. And you heard at the outset of our conversation, Jonathan Beloff express his disappointment that uh, they couldn't, well, catch others along with Kabuga. Your thoughts on that? I mean, it's, it, 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 is, it is justice denied if it is delayed. The delay is way too long. A number of the survivors have died. And, you know, one person is, is good, but it's not good enough because there are several others. Um, if if um, Augustine Biziyama is, is dead, um, there's still seven of, the, of those who have been indicted by, by the ICTR. What has happened to the rest of them? Where are they? Why isn't it not being done to find them? And those are the questions that need to be answered. And there are, we believe that they should, that question should be properly in, investigated. And every one of the countries that have been complicit in, in, in you know, shrouding and uh, in secrecy, these individuals should be held to account on, at the inter, inter, international level. Patrick de Saint-Exupéry, uh, we talked about the role of France earlier. You heard uh, Jonathan Beloff uh, mention uh, the uh, training of uh, the militias that carried out the genocide by the French, uh, which is a position that's uh, denied by the French government. Official policy is to say that did not happen. Uh, you're, when you think that already France is having trouble grappling with its past in Algeria, how do you do it when it comes to Rwanda? Well, I said the same sort of questions. Uh, we do have a real problem to deal with our past in Rwanda, uh, definitely. Um, and one of, of the proof of that is, is a very singular fact. Uh, Abia Ramena, wife, the wife of the president who has been killed, is living for years and years in Paris. And she was very close to Kabuga uh, geographically and uh, intellectually, uh, let's say. Uh, I got Kamzinga is still living in years of, for years and years in Paris, and his status is still pending. Is she, is she accused of having been participating in, in, in the genocide? There is nothing sure officially. Everyone knows knows that that she was in the earth in the heart of the mechanism of the system, but she is in a way protected in Paris still again still. Today, this is very shameful, and it's shameful for me, for Rwandan people, and I think it's also shameful for French people. And uh, Patrick, the the political third rail of what is already a very sensitive topic here in France is then discussing uh, who shot down the plane carrying Rwanda and Burundi's presidents. That was the trigger on the April 6, nineteen ninety four, of the genocide. Uh, there are accusations, counter accusations. Would this trial shed any light on that? Well, there have been a, a really light, uh, an official French investigation of the justice uh, 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 arrived to the conclusion that uh, the missile were, were fired uh, uh, from the presidential camp in Kigali. Uh, so there is no question still pending on that. Uh, extremist, or two extremists. Uh, have, have done the, the, the killing of that president. That's, that's obvious and there is no more discussion. Just some sort of stupid discussion by people who don't want to admit the fact that the fact is here. So if Hutu extremists killed their own president who was on their side, where was Kabuga in this? That's one of the biggest questions of, of, the, of the trial. And uh, with that question, you're just in the earth. Why the extremist people take the decision to kill their president to get 
the genocide just in the hours after. This is a real politically motivated decision, very cynic, but very politically motivated, and with a lot of preparation before. And that will be the purpose of the trial. That's at the point where there is a real need of justice, even if so even if it's 25 years later, that will be still justice. And that's the most important point everyone is waiting for. Jonathan Beloff, uh, will the trial of Felicien Kabuga shed any new light on uh, the downing of President Javier Mana's plane? I do not believe, I do not believe it's going to bring anything massively new. <clears throat> the the shooting down of Habiamana's plane, which triggered the genocide, which has been prepared, let's be honest, for decades. Um, it is heavily political rather than based on the historical narratives. And you know, uh, uh, as already said, you know, the location and the political reasons for the assassination happening in the. Uh, by the president's own house, by the head of the of their top military base, um, with the Akazu, with the power structures massively um, facing trouble, with implementation of a peace accord between them and the Rwanda Patriotic Front, which was threatening their stranglehold economically, politically, and financially of the country. Um, all this is already known. The problem is that personal politics and not trying to grapple with history prevents a real examination of, for the truth at least to come out. And I believe with the with this trial, we are not going to get too many new uh, releva- uh, revela- revelations, but we might be able to get some little bits of detail here and there. All right, better than nothing. Uh, yeah. I want to thank you, Jonathan Beloff, for joining us from New York City. Thank I you. want to thank uh, Mausi Shagun for being uh, with us from Abuja. Patrick de Saint-Exupéry here in Paris. Judence Caïtesi uh, in southern uh, Germany. Um, and we want to thank you as well for joining us here in the France 24 uh, debate. Uh, more on our website, france24.com. Bye for now.